Welcome back to Paleo Talks, everybody. This week we have Dr. Andy Heckert. How are you doing, Andy? I, I am well. How are you? We're doing well. Andy's just on the other side of the mountain over in Boone. So very close to us, very close to us, but we've got some orogenies, I guess, happening right between us. And <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, if, well, if I went about two miles west, I'd be in the same drainage basin. That's uh, true. So, <laughs> well, we've got Chris and David with us today, and uh, let's uh, let's just move on forward, David. If you want to go ahead and tell everybody how it works, and then we'll get back to Andy. Sure thing. Welcome back, everybody. We're excited to be back. This Paleo Talks is not going to be all that different. We're doing the same format as always. So we're going to start here in just a second by introducing our guest, and then launch into our main presentation. And as we get towards the end of the presentation, we're going to ask that you keep in mind any questions you have, because once the presentation is done, the rest of the program is Q&A. So some of our people here on the Zoom call will have some questions, and we'll also take questions from the audience. So when Q&A time comes around, go ahead and put your questions in the comments of the Facebook video. Or if you can't leave a comment on Facebook, as always, I'll be keeping an eye on the Gray Fossil Site Twitter and Instagram accounts in case you want to reach us that way and we'll read out your questions for Andy to answer. All right, thanks David for reminding us how it all works. And Andy, we're just gonna go right to you and the way we do this is let you introduce yourself and tell us, tell the world how you got into paleontology in the first place and then the track you took to where you're at today. Okay, so well, if you don't mind, then I'll just, I'll start sharing because I, I have an intro slide that right. hopefully sort of covers that ground here um, <laughs> so all right so yeah so um, my full name's A Andrew Heckard um, and I grew up in uh, southwestern Ohio which any paleo aficionado knows is so full of fossils or division invertebrates that if you took them all out it'd go below sea level um, so I was, you know, so I had a lot of exposure to just some fossil collecting. My father and my grandfather were both um, kind of amateur rock hounds. And so we had some, uh, had some experience to collecting things there. And, and even now I have a huge collection of brachiopods and bryzoans and things like that. Um, and then I was also fortunate that my family traveled and we went to museums and things like that. So I was, um, the way I understand it to have happened was that at the Field Museum, when I was about five, they were showing off um, the King Tut exhibit. And apparently a deal was made that if I just shut up and let my parents enjoy the King Tut exhibit, then we could go to the bookstore and I could get some dinosaur books, a couple of which are actually probably on the shelf behind me. Um, so, you know, so I was one of those little kids who always kind of wanted to be a paleontologist, never really came up with anything different. And you can see from the, the kind of academic degrees I've shown up there that I went to a little liberal arts school, a, a fine university called Denison University in Central Ohio. And um, then I went out west to the University of New Mexico, which has the distinction of having to remind people that it is in the United States, that, the, that New Mexico is one of the 50 states. Um, but I was able to do a lot of field work out there and a lot and get a lot of research experience as well. Um, so my master's and PhDs were technically in earth and planetary science is what that is, but they were basically stratigraphy, vert paleo degrees. Um, I stayed on. I was a collections manager out there for a few years after I finished my PhD. Uh, and then I've been at Appalachian State now for uh, quite a while. So my, my position here is I primarily teach classes about the history of the planet. I have a general education class on dinosaurs. Um, and then I teach a sort of my class, my main class called Evolution of the Earth. And then um, we like to take advantage of our proximity to the gray and get some of our students over to see you guys uh, every so often now too, at least when there's not a global pandemic and everything isn't all shut down. So hopefully that gives you a little flavor for what I'm about. Whoops, and I just went straight to my title slide if we're good. Um, How did you get to you know, transition in from, from being the dinosaurs to, to moving on to something else in the Triassic and, and Cretaceous? 
So, um, well, actually, I may even have because I, I kind of threw a couple different slides together. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I, I kind of feel like I'm a bit of an anachronism. I mean, I would be so happy just being out west and collecting and and so on. Um, and so, what happened was in the like, early 1900s, also or late 1800s. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, no, this was a, that picture. The art department was doing a little fundraiser, and you could get a tenotype done. Um, so I'm actually wearing like totally modern gear in that thing, but, uh, it just looks so, so vintage. I love that, I love that photo. Best $10 I ever, I ever donated. Um, so yeah, so, I mean, fundamentally, yeah, I was like many people, I thought, oh, all dinosaurs and everything like that. And I actually, when I, when I was going to New Mexico, I thought I had a Cretaceous project. I'd talked to uh, Spencer Lucas was the curator at the museum that I was going to be working with and he'd sold me on this Cretaceous of the boot heel of New Mexico and when I got down there um, when I finally got to meet him he was traveling and whatever I finally got to meet him in person a couple weeks later and this is all before the internet before email even I finally got to meet him I'm like okay yeah I'm ready to go on this Cretaceous project he's like oh that's that project's terrible I don't, I don't know why I was telling you about that project you're going to work in the Triassic and my first thought was Oh no, because like this was early 90s. I was like, I don't know anything about those thecodonts. I, mean, I can't remember any, I can't keep them straight or whatever. Um, so I mean, in, in the talk itself, I'll probably try and talk about why I think the, the Triassic is important. But it basically I was offered an opportunity to do a microvertebrate project. And I found out that um, you know especially when you start really doing vertebrate paleontology and you're trying to illustrate specimens and things like that you're like wow you can you can do a lot with little fossils basically um there you know there's you can work on so many different animal types you can you can collect a lot of data and you can you can learn a lot about an ecosystem i mean i used to think sauropods were cool and then then you try and illustrate a sauropod vertebra in, in three views and that takes like three men and a horse and all day to manipulate and light and whatever. And you're like, you know, I think I like my microvertebrates better. Or curated in a museum. Yeah. Like so, yeah. So, um, so yeah, no, I, I really like being a, you know, field-based guy now. So I, you know, there's probably not any really one group there's, there are Edisars, but, you know, I'm not like many vertebrate paleontologists. I'm not, I'm not the go-to guy for a particular animal necessarily, but, um, but I like that you go out into the field and you collect and you know, what you study sort of depends on what you find. Um, so, and the, the pro of that is that you get to learn a lot about a lot of different animals. Um, so you almost never really know what you might be working on next. All right. Well, you wanna go ahead and get us back to that intro slide and sure. we'll start the presentation. So yeah, so I, I may not have updated it to your title actually now that I look at it, but yeah, basically I work on, on microvertebrates and so we'll talk about what microvertebrates are. They're the, the small, bo the bones and teeth of relatively small animals in an ecosystem. And I'm particularly interested in, in Triassic ones. And so um, I think one of the major reasons you guys invited me on this is because you'd seen through the magic of Facebook and the rest of the internet that I had been in, um, I had been in South Africa and then in Poland this last year, I had a sabbatical and I, that sabbatical was courtesy of Fulbright. Um, in my mind, this is about the best tax dollars um, around that the State Department's ever provided me with anyway. Certainly, I like this use of my tax dollars and that it basically got me um, to Poland and South Africa from August until the end of the year last year. And so I got this slide up partly to promote because I don't think that you know, vertebrate paleontologists really exploit this program as well as they might. And there's not only are there chances for a paleontologist to go to other countries, but there's also they've got a quite generous funding program to bring paleontologists from other countries to the United States. And um, so this is something that um, I think a lot of people could um, could learn from or work with. And I had what was known as a flex award. And then the cool thing about a flex reward is that it requires that you go to two different countries for at least a month apiece. 
And this is, of course, ideal for Triassic workers because our animals are found in all the continents because it was Pangaea at the time. And so, and I think Fulbright really wants people to go to places beyond just Europe too. So it's perfect to, you know, go to South Africa. I'm, you know, I'm thinking about going to South America on another one. I need to put together something like that. So it's just a, it was a perfect thing for, um, for South America, you know, for what I was doing last semester. So, so we kind of covered who I am. Um, let's, um, you know, just, I think it's kind of fun to consider, right? So I was gone for four and a half months and that's what I packed. Um, and it was a challenging little, you know, set of things. Cause of course in the Southern hemisphere, I went down there during their winter, it was transitioning to summer. South Africa is climatically very different from Poland. I had contacts, we'll talk about those more in South Africa, um, but I, you know, fewer in Poland. Poland, but of course, Poland is a, is a Western, you know, is, there, is a European country anyway. So I knew kind of more about how it'd get around and so on. So, um, you know, there's complex logistics. Um, so yeah, we had a bunch of flights and air miles. And of course there was this global pandemic thing that people might've heard a little bit about that made it a little challenging, but, um, you know, so it was, a, it was an adventure. Um, it was, a, it was a lot of fun there. So I just kind of throws you know through some kind of stats up but i appreciate you guys let me add another presentation of the list that have been done related to all this kind of thing um so what i really want to talk about today is this uh drefontaine microvertebrate locality so i you know, courtesy of a colleague named john hancox who i first met at a professional meeting um in the late 90s a, tri a global triassic workers meeting in germany and he had found this incredible microvertebrate site in the lower Triassic of South Africa. And the picture there is sort of the general area. It's called Drefontaine. And um, you know, there's not a lot of these microvertebrate sites known in the early Triassic. And John is no longer in academia. He, he runs a, a highly successful geological consulting business. And I've done a lot of microvertebrate work and he and I got along well. And he's, I mean, they've published a lot of articles on this, but he basically invited me to, to come down and try and push the pile forward a little bit. And I, you know, this is an important evolutionary topic because we're very shortly after the uh, Triassic, uh, the Permo Triassic boundary. So we've got that major extinction event that um, is especially severe in the oceans, but is also a, a tetrapod extinction event too. So this is sort of how are we going to set up Triassic ecosystems going forward? Um, so for those not familiar with the, the grand time scale course, we're, we're interested in where I have a, a blue star there. We're interested in something that in the grand scheme of the planet is, is really quite recent, um, you know, 200 to 251 million years ago. And if you, right, if you take a historical geology type class or whatever, you always learn, I mean, the Triassic to many of us is sort of the beginning of, of the modern world and that all the Paleozoic animals are really kind of alien to what we would see in an ecosystem today. And a lot of these animals that we do see today, you know, lizards, frogs, salamanders, ter uh, turtles, and things that we think of as classically Mesozoic, like dinosaurs and pterosaurs, these all have their origins in the Triassic. So that, that makes the Triassic, I think, a very interesting period of time. And of course, it's also the only period that is bounded by two mass extinctions. There's a mass extinction at the Permo-Triassic boundary, of course, and then another one that is much less severe at the Triassic-Jurassic boundary. And of course, I've spent most of my career actually in you know, most of the animals I've studied traditionally have been of late Triassic age and uh, principally from the American West, but also Germany and Argentina and places like that. So this was a bit of a adjustment for me because I was I was moving down in the time scale, but we we're trying to get to a place where some things are um, some very interesting things are happening. So that Drefontaine, and then the reason to go to Poland was that the Poles have described a, a really nice microvertebrate assemblage of similar age from Poland. So this was an opportunity to uh, look at that assemblage as well. 
Um, this website, actually, the bio, the HSMI.org Biointeractive is a really nice place to go. It's now if you want, um, they're all Chris Costis uh, reconstructions of the continents, but it gives you a chance to see why it's Triassic workers. You, you might end up working just about anywhere in the world is because, of course, it's the time of Pangea. And so I tried to give an uh, indication of where at least Chris thinks that Drifontaine and the Polish locality, Czakowice, is here. So, um, and of course, I've spent most of my time in the Western United States, which is sort of the Western side of that globe. Now, you know, what made this really interesting, and this, this has been a problem, we've known this, that this is a problem, is that there just aren't many of these microvertebrate assemblages. We know very little about small vertebrates from Gondwana just generally. There are like isolated individual specimens of you know, various animals, but most of what we know about microvertebrates actually comes from Laurasia. And it's, it's just, it seems to be a weird facies thing because I mean, I'm not the first nor the last to try to, to change this. Uh, people have spent weeks in the field in Argentina and Brazil trying, trying just to, you know, to find that great new microvertebrate site in either of those countries. And we've, we've just not had a lot of luck. But so the opportunity to work on one in South Africa is, um, is really nice. The other Gondwana and microvertebrates, there's, there are actually, there are several assemblages now known from India, although they all tend to be of the younger part of the Triassic. So, I mean, you know, to me, as a field-based vertebrate paleontologist, I'm just, you know, first order, I'm very interested in, you know, what's, what's the diversity of these ecosystems over geologic time. And um, you know, a lot of us are interested in, in the Triassic because it's the so-called dawn of the age of dinosaurs. There's synapsids, there's, um, so there's proto-mammals, there's proto-dinosaurs. If you were betting in the early Triassic, you would think the proto-mammals would win out. And, for, and obviously that doesn't really happen until after the Cretaceous. So you know, a variety of questions I think that are very interesting to try to explore. Um, now, what do I mean by a, a microvertebrate? Well, you know, most people are, I think, especially I'm sure the audience here, very familiar with kind of traditional vertebrates. That's a upper Triassic phytosaur from Poland there. Uh, Matt Selesky did this nice little taphonomy of a, of a Arizona saurus kind of thing. You're used to seeing sort of, you know, mid to large size animals um, found as skeletons or partial skeletons or so on, things like that. Um, and certainly South Africa has a rich record of these, many famous things like Lystrosaurus, known from South Africa, and um, things like Procolophonid, also known from South Africa. These are smaller animals, but still basically you know, relatively you know, centimeter scale, you know, quarter, half meter long animals. And to get this kind of really good preservation, you need to have like nearly instantaneous burial. So um, a concept I was introduced to a few years ago, I really like is the idea of the sort of time poor horizon. So there's loads of Lystrosaurus in South Africa and Procolophon. And a lot of these things are, we think were buried in burrows during a, a flood event or, or other things like that. Um, so they're kind of geologically instantaneous. Now, microvertebrates tend to, of course, be much more fragmentary fossils. You can see a bunch of fish scales there on the left, and on the right, you can see a particularly rich uh, Triassic microvertebrate assemblage from New Mexico. I've recently had the pleasure of being able to work with. And typically, the way you've kind of found these things, or the way you work with these things, is that you find a site with a lot of bone on the surface and maybe st strong indications of smaller bones, Maybe when you get down on your hands and knees, you start seeing some fish scales and things like that. Coprolites, of course, fossilized feces are actually a really good sign that you might have a microvertebrate assemblage. So kind of working our way around the clock from 10 o'clock around, what you see is a, a bunch of my students collecting a bunch of matrix. Um, and then we take that matrix back and we run it through a series of sieves. Um, and we rinse that matrix and try and get all the muds and fines and everything else to break down. And then we have something here at Appalachian and called Finding Fossils on Fridays, where I get a bunch of undergraduates to pick through the residue 
on Friday afternoon before our, our normal seminar time is at 3.30 p.m. Um, so we try and, you know, we get a bunch of people picking through things and you can see on the, on the bottom there, the five o'clock slot is you know, representative microvertebrates on some millimeter scale graph paper. We have some very nice instruments where we can image those things. Students present posters and the best of them, we can even publish things. So this is sort of typical microvertebrate material is that you collect matrix, wash it, sieve it, pick it, and, and see what you have. Now, the interesting thing about Drefontaine is that Mother Nature's actually kind of done that for you. And John's a, John's a geologist, has done a lot of work on the assemblage and on the stratigraphy of that assemblage. And you know, the, the point of, of doing the work with the microvertebrates is that this is a slide that kind of shows what we knew about that assemblage if you just took animals whose remains were at least a centimeter or larger. Um, and we, you have a, an assemblage of animals. You have you know, some kind of primitive archosauromorphs. You have a, a bunch of amphibians and a few other things that you know about. But Drefontaine is got, it appears to be sort of a winnowed assemblage where a lot of materials let down and there's an actual lag. So there in the lower left, perhaps you can see that we've got a whole bunch of bones and fragments and other things in a rock. And in places, those are weathering out completely. So John has been able to take advantage of that. And basically, Mother Nature did the sieving. So here's John doing what he loves to do best, which is sit down in the richest part of Drefontaine and just pick up dozens to hundreds of fossils. He'll, he'll collect like a kilogram of sediment and take it back and wash it and get a couple hundred fossils out of it. So when I showed up in South Africa, and I mean, he and I had talked about this, he had shared a lot of images with me. So that, that collections crate there you see is various microvertebrates that he's picked. And each bag has a photo of a microvertebrate and a tiny bone or tooth or fish scale or coprolite or something in it. And his little dynolite that he was taking pictures with, the first picture was A001. And at B, it increments up one. So you can see the folder there that we, the folders there we have on the right, I have a little bit of screenshot. So there's you know, literally thousands and thousands of images of thousands of, of specimens. Um, and it's just all manner, you know, every specimen has at least one photo, maybe as many as seven or eight. So there's a, a wide range of things. There's some interesting animal called Pro uh, Pilacridon and a bunch of other things. So obviously in two and a half months, even I'm, and I'm supposed to be able to go back here later this year, um, you can only make so much of a dent in that pile. But when you look at that assemblage, all of a sudden, right, you really flesh out the ecosystem. We find, you know, there's freshwater sharks, there's a lot of smaller animals, the sort of lizard sized animals, the mouse sized animals, the things that you can't really find the bones of otherwise. And um, it becomes an incredibly, it's an incredibly rich ecosystem. And this has got to be the richest single site in Gondwana that I can think of, certainly in the, in the lower Triassic. Um, so I got to spend a few months in South Africa. Um, that's a desktop SEM. I'd never seen such a thing before, but they had an SEM there. So they walked me into the room and they said, okay, here's the SEM. And I'm like, where? Because I thought that was just the PC that ran it. I said, oh, and they're like, oh, no, that's the... That's it there. So a um, lot of time spent on a microscope, a lot of time on an SEM. Um, nowadays, of course, micro CT is becoming a possibility and so on. So some of the things I did just that I'm working on with him, we're trying to talk about, we're trying to kind of better catalog the freshwater sharks, get better understanding of those, trying to get an understanding of the fish. Um, which are largely only known from fish scales. And I mean, there's doubtless a lot of fish skull bones, but the, the challenge is that most vertebrate paleontologists that work on fish like to work on complete skulls of, uh, or complete specimens of fish. And we don't have that, of course. Um, and there's a, a bunch of reptile questions, which are, we're very interested in addressing. So these are some of the SEM images I took, and I was, a, I was a little lazy here. I just put the plates we're preparing for publication. So there's some stereo pairs on there. You're not, you're not seeing double. 
But these are the freshwater sharks and the scale bars are still the, the raw scales from the, um, from the SEM. So the actual bar is smaller and some of those things are like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeter scale. So these, these are tiny, tiny freshwater sharks. This is a, a, a genus or a genera, Lesotus, Lonchidians, another name used for these are very closely related things. And in the broad sense, this shark is known from Devonian to Cretaceous strata, various species. Um, but these are among the smallest such teeth known, and they're right after the Triassic, Jurassic, or I'm sorry, the Permo Triassic extinction. So um, we're working with Chris to describe these specimens. And then there's a slightly larger, as in, like, you know. I know I've reached my students when they tell me that oh, I found this giant tooth that's like three millimeters long. Um, so, um, and that's about the size of some of the shark teeth here. This is a, a taxon called Polyacrotus. So we've got a little bit, you know, so we're, we're adding to the diversity of this. And, I'm, I'm, and we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of fossils and we don't have anything bigger than this. I mean, some of these related taxa are related to this. They get centimeter scale teeth than other geologic time periods. So I think we can make a legitimate case for some miniaturization perhaps after the Permo-Triassic uh, boundary. Um, so that's been, that's been one very fun project to, to be working on there. The fish are, are challenging, but you know, we're, we're trying to accumulate as many different morphotypes as possible and, and match those to, to published illustrations and see just how many fish we might have. Um, of course, challenging because every fish has hundreds and hundreds of scales, but you can, you can start to assign them to regions of the body and, and so on. Um, so we're trying to get a handle on sort of what's the, what are the smaller vertebrates in this ecosystem like. Um, this is not my project, but I'm going to push it just a little bit. Keep your eyes open. There's a woman named Shondale Montgomery who's working on the coprolites from that site, and they've CT scanned a lot of them. And they're finding a lot of cool things in there, um, a lot of very interesting things. Um, uh, the poles have done this with some late Triassic coprolites, but of course, the, again, these are early Triassic. Um, so there's all sorts of diversity there. And then on the, on the right-hand side are some really fun ones, because those are some lungfish teeth that are basically preserved entirely in coprolites. Um, here's some close-ups of those kind of things. So, I mean, the nice thing that coprolites give you is a, a definitive ecological interaction, right? Somebody ate a lungfish. Um, that, that, is, that much is clear. Exactly who ate the lungfish is a matter of some debate, but um, there's some nifty things that are going to be known out of those. The coprolites are also actually where we get our best fish specimens. We get semi-articulated or several, you know, we get articulated fish scales out of some of those coprolites. So, um, so the work sort of overlaps there. Uh, here's a, a close up of some, of, and the preservation of these fish scales is actually really quite nice. They still have some iridescence to them and, uh, and so on. So again, you know, having all that and the information from the coprolites or whatever allows us to really flesh out an ecosystem and, and, and easily double or triple the, the diversity known from, a, from an assemblage. And I think if we, you know, trying to talk about bigger picture questions, this, this is absolutely essential, especially if for some reason, um, some of your attacks are really only known from a uh, small body size. So why'd I go to Poland? Well, I actually got to go out in the field in Poland. So I appreciate my colleagues taking me out. It was Thanksgiving Day, which actually is not a holiday in Poland, surprisingly. Um, but um, they took me out to a brick pit in, uh, in Poland. And so I got this, was, and this was a relatively rare sunny November day in Poland, but it's a lot like being a brick pit in North Carolina otherwise, um, but red Triassic rocks. And um, Growing up, nobody talked about Poland in the Triassic, and that's because these two papers, which came out in like 98, 99, are, were pretty much the 20th century and earlier record of Triassic vertebrates from Poland. But once they really started looking at those rocks, 
Um, I mean, it's just, they said, it's kind of funny, you know, they went to Mongolia, you know, the, um, the various women um, cited here had done big Cretaceous excavations in Mongolia, and but nobody had really looked locally. And um, when they started doing it, I mean, that's what's known, that that's a bibliography of Polish Triassic vertebrate paleontology now. I mean, they have really been turning and burning and they have some very, very rich assemblages. And what I was interested in was this one that um, Borsuk Bialnica had published called uh, Czakovica, and there was a volume that came out on this in 2009. And these are a very different taponomic setting. These are fissure fills. So what you had is, is carbonate rocks, karst topography um, that had cracks and fissures in it, and animals may have crawled in there and lived. They certainly died. They may have gotten washed into those fissures and so on. And the preservation is truly stunning. Unfortunately, the you know getting stratigraphy out of it is very challenging because it's not like you can find a discrete layer. It's actually these cracks and crevices in older rocks. Um, but the preservation is absolutely unbelievable. I mean, the the uh, procolina there, that procolifana jaw. The main reason you know that's not recent contamination is because procolifonids went extinct at the end of the Triassic. So, uh, but other than that, I mean, the, they, they even feel light with tweezers. Um, and there's very important fossils there. The, one of the oldest known frogs is what I've got there on the, on the left-hand side. The silvers, because they, they have coded it for SEM analysis on the, on the one side. So I was going there to try and compare some of these fossils and hope to see something that would tell me that maybe we had a, a frog at Drefontaine or, or something like that. And then the other thing that that's really going to help me do is that we've got some amazing localities here in the uh, Triassic of North America, which are easier for me to do things like bring students to and collect. So there's this homestead site that the Lauer Foundation has acquired and we are working with them and Virginia Tech and the Natural History Museum of the UK. And the best, if the best geologists have seen the most rocks, the best paleontologists have seen the most fossils. So the more fossils you can sort of add to your index or library, um, the better off you are as far as being able to identify other things, and especially when you're dealing with microvertebrates and these sort of super fragmentary fossils um, and things like that. So um, I'm sort of I'm at a, a transition point here, Blaine. I could pro, you know, I can go a little longer, or I can kind I can kind of wrap up and conclude whatever whatever works for you guys. I'd say go ahead for another five minutes. Okay, cool. So, all right, so some things we're thinking about here, we'll, we'll try and make this, this kind of brief, right, is you know, everybody in, I don't know, like sixth grade or something like that, you, you learn a sort of kind of typical ecosystem concept of plants and herbivores and stacked lines of predators and things like that. And one of the things that really bothers us looking at places like Drefontaine or whatever is that we just don't really see that. Now, you have to take into account it's, that it's the fossil record and you don't get true snapshots of an ecosystem. But right, you, you kind of learn that you know, the biomass and the species diversity is all concentrated at the, at the lower niches and smaller body sizes and decreases you know, semi-exponentially as you, as you go up on the curve. But like I say, if you, if you think about this in the fossil record, it's very, very difficult to really get all of those animals. And especially if you really want to be serious and add things like plants and things like that, even using pollen or whatever, it's just very challenging to get an, an honest snapshot of the entirety of a terrestrial ecosystem just because of the preservation bias. And we're not even talking here, of course, about soft-bodied animals. Um, so you know, when we look at Drefontaine, what we see is just an enormous number of predatory animals and almost nothing that's clearly an herbivore. And this has actually always bothered me about the late Triassic too in the American West. I mean, yeah, there's a few Dicynodonts and there's Aetosars, whatever they eat. But um, the more we look at a lot of these microvertebrate assemblages, the more they look very aquatic. They're just, you know, we always kind of thought that some of these animals are aquatic, but they just look like 
um, more aquatic ecosystems where you just have more and more, I think of them as kind of vertically stacked um, carnivore rich ecosystems where you know, there's a lot of animals that are eating other animals that are eating other animals that are eating other animals until you get up to, um, in the case of Drefontaine Garjania, which is huge at two meters or so body size, um, but a, a big predator for the, for the time. But I do think that um, if we turn these kind of big, broad questions about the biodiversity, what or what we're starting to see is that, you know, it, it, that the you know sort of the cartoon story of the Triassic has always been that you start with a bunch of the more primitive amphibians, the temnospondyl amphibians, lots of synapsids, lots of anapsid animals, and those all wane, and the archosauromorphs and the lepidosauromorphs. Um, wax stronger through the course of the um, of Triassic time. And I, I think that there's a case to be made for that. I mean, controlling all that, doing serious paleobiology with that, that's going to be a challenge. But I'm, I'm thinking that we do sort of see that in these ecosystems overall. So, um, so I hope with that, then, that um, I've convinced you guys that you know, this 1% of Earth history that's the Triassic, about 50 million years from 251 to 201 or so, is, is really, really interesting. And hopefully people are encouraged or intrigued by the idea of looking at all these small vertebrate fossils and um, learning a great deal more about an ecosystem from these things. Um, and you know, certainly I think, I mean, there's a lot more to do. I mean, the more I was down there looking at this Drefontaine microvertebrates, I was like, wow, there's, there really is a PhD project here for one, you know, these animals are a PhD project. These animals are a PhD project, et cetera. Um, so I think hopefully you'll be hearing a lot more about Drefontaine in the, in the future. So, um, I would do def def definitely wish to thank my colleagues there down there in South Africa for um, for encouraging me to come down there and work on these projects. And they were very gracious hosts. I even was able to sneak out and do a little field work in the Triassic of South Africa too. Um, my Polish colleagues also wonderful, wonderful colleagues. Work getting around Poland was way easier than I would have thought it might have been. Um, and of course, I had. Um, you know, I had a lot of people back here at home who also were, uh, um, including a, a department that dealt without um, me being around for a whole semester. Um, so, and then my South African colleagues, of course, have a bunch of, of um, acknowledgements too. And then I think I'm happy to, to throw it open to questions. All right, excellent. I have lots of questions and I, I see we have quite an audience too. Um, one of the first things that just occurred to me is is wondering what size screen you're you're using typically. Is it the same across your different sites? Um, yeah, no, I. I um, we, that's some really small material. Yeah, so um, when I you know when I've washed in the U.S., you know, just kind of making screens, you're you're. We have sort of a quarter inch, and then if you could find it, there was eighth inch hardware cloth, and then we used like window screen and things like that. When I can use real sieves, I use like four millimeter, two millimeter, one millimeter um, sieves. And then lately, what um, what a collector turned me on to is these using paint sieves, and those those also get down to about a half millimeter, and they're these fabric sieves that you put in a paint bucket to keep your spray paint, um, your paint sprayer from clogging up. And we've been using those a lot. Um, they don't size sort, but they're wonderful for breaking stuff down, and then you can run it through sieves. So yeah, site to site, it depends on where the, where the richness is. Um, but um, we... Um, we like to use um, those paint sieves for, um, for the main breakdown. And then the one millimeter fraction tends to be really rich, but even in some localities, the half millimeter to one millimeter thing can be, can be quite rich. So. Um, I think it's, I mean, it's funny to us when you start talking about the Triassic being relatively recent. And of course it is geologically speaking, but we're working on sites that are quaternary and our old site is 5 million years old. 
Right. And, and so, you know, one thing I have to wonder about is you're, as you're doing all of this screen washing and looking at these microvertebrates is how many people are doing this or how many people have done this when it comes to localities of this age? There's, um, there was sort of a, a one worker, a generation thing for a little while. I mean, a guy named Phil Murray preceded me in the Triassic of the Western United States. Um, but it's definitely, it's picked up in the last, you know, this century in particular, it's picked up and the technology is enabling us to do more and different things too. Mm -hmm. So now, I mean, I was sort of, you know, and I swung to this slide just because it was kind of convenient, but I was encouraged to collect a lot of sediment, wash a lot of sediment and just pick it out. And now more and more people are trying to collect small blocks of sediment and maybe even CT scanning those blocks before they do them. So yeah, Sterling Nesbitt and his research group at Virginia Tech, he has multiple students attacking these things. And so they've, they've pushed the pile considerably far forward. I'm always grateful that it take, appears to take several of them. Um, so, but, um, and that, you know, there's different sites. And, and when you get a site, the Germans have had some site, found some sites where the stuff is articulated. The Poles have some sites where, um, you know, so you're seeing more and more effort on it. And it, there is, you know, and along those lines, I mean, the Argentines and Brazilians and the South Africans are all interested and the Indians are all interested in this too. And it's just really the Indians for whatever reason have all, are the only ones who've um, been able to find multiple sites that are kind of truly microvertebrate, but there's, there's information out there. I'm really intrigued by the, the fissure fill ones. That just seems sort of like a, a new concept almost of being able to look at something where you have that accumulation of disarticulated remains. I don't know if you have any feel for what kind of time averaging could be in a fissure fill like that. Yeah, I, I think at that point, you're really, let me try and get there very quickly. You're, um, you're really married to the pollen record and things like that at that point. Um, the, ironically, I mean, this was one of the cases in the, in the Triassic. Mick Fraser in particular did a PhD in the 80s on some British fissure fills, and a lot of other people have worked on them, Pamela Robinson before that. Um, but yeah, there were these things, and they were like, well, they're, they're Rishan, whatever that is, or maybe some of them are Jurassic. And I mean, you can, they, you can map them, but again, it's just, you know, and you can see that there's multiple episodes of infill. Mm -hmm. uh, but pinning those down globally is extraordinarily challenging and not amenable to the kind of things, because now, of course, we can date single zircons, and that, that's improving our understanding of the uh, numerical ages of non-marine deposits, but that's not really a viable approach in the fissures so much, I don't think. Um, so no, it's very challenging. On the other hand, you know, you get these associations and those, those Chekhovicha fossils are just astounding. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the richness and the preservation. Um, I mean, you wouldn't think that you could tell a fossil isn't mineralized when at the end of the tweezers, but you know, <laughs> it is, they're lighter. They're really super light. Um, they're really- Are they in a breccia? Yeah, they're, they were in sort of a breccia that, yeah, so these are, yeah, they're in a sort of a brecciated fissure fill thing. And so these were pictures from one of the pubs that they, and then they rinsed and, you know, and I think they even used a little acid to break it down, as, as I recall. Um, I know they did that with the British fissures. Um, but yeah, if you can, if you can find things like that, they're potentially extraordinarily rich. Um, and we're definitely just generally Triassic workers now trying to wash smaller batches of sediment so that when you find interesting things, you have some chance of reassembling them or at least thinking that they might be associated. That, that kind of kind of touches on my question. Um, you know, here at Gray, we have, <laughs> if you look back out, on the site, uh, we have bags and bags and bags and bags of matrix. Uh, and so we have a backlog of, of matrix to pick uh, for microvertebrates. Do you have something like that? I mean, are you, are you sitting on giant piles of Triassic material from New Mexico and slowly working your way through? Or is it something where you've, through the years, you've kind of reached a good balance between the uh -huh. students that you have working on stuff? I, I love the, the picking on Fridays thing. Yeah, um, 
I got if I if I finish everything on my hard drive and in the lane case to the right of me, then it's going to be a wonderful career. Um, I got so much data backed up, but I also you know love going out and trying to collect more. And I mean, there's a part of me that thinks I could probably just go down to Dree Fontaine and you know South Africa and work with John and work on those microvertebrates. I mean, we ducked out to the site real briefly, came back, you know, another 300 specimens easily, you know, of, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, of like diagnostic animals, not, you know, 300 like identifiable specimens. Um, no, I love what you guys are doing with um, with washing all that. For a while, I was trying to make sure that we washed all the matrix from jackets in the Triassic when I lit, but, um, but I'm not out there anymore. I'm not the collections manager. I don't have, I mean, I do especially, I miss the proximity of the field, but as far as screen washing goes, what I've missed screen washing in New Mexico where drying took 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> And on a humid day, it took 30. Um, so yeah, no, there's, there's mountains of data out there. Um, and I need to, you know, I need to finish some projects. We've got this incredible new rich site that we'll, we'll keep on, we'll keep on working on. Um, so no, I, I mean, I do like to think that you just, you collect as much data as you can. And even if you don't get to work on it, at least it's in a museum somewhere and somebody for they're down the line, maybe we'll be able to do so. Andy, some of these critters that, that I see, you know, here working in the Quaternary and working back into the Miocene, we can recognize, you know, okay, this is a mammal, this is a rhino, it's this genus probably. But I look at some of these things and how, I mean, some of them you must be like, where do we even start with some of these? Yeah, that, that, that happens in the Triassic a lot. And we're, <laughs> and, you know, and, and you can be wrong a lot too. I mean, when I was doing my dissertation, we thought that um, we thought a lot of these um, small serrated teeth might be early dinosaurs of various ilk. And then we found out that many of those animals are, are not. Um, actually, uh, let me, let me flip to a, a slide that I have of that. So no, it's all, you know, that was one of the great challenges is because people who usually, you know, right, mammal workers have been doing this forever. And, um, and mammals have, of course, have extraordinarily distinct teeth. I mean, even in my Cretaceous you know, sort of side hobby work, right? We find you're excited when you find a mammal tooth, you know, it's a mammal and you know that somebody somewhere has described the jaw and you're going to be able to say what that animal is. And yeah, one of, one of the fundamental questions that challenges us so much in the Triassic is that, you know, you know broadly speaking, these serrated teeth are usually belong to some sort of archosauriform um, animal. And so you'd love to use modern animals as an analog. Well, the problem is the modern archosaurs, you either have birds, which of course have you know, lost their dentition entirely, or you've got crocodiles, which have really simplified their dentitions. And so you know, when we collect this, yeah, I mean, what does that mean? Is that is that four animals? Is that six animals? Um, you know, we know that tooth position matters somewhat. Uh, so there, you know, and people, uh, one of my former students who's now up with Sterling, Devin Hoffman and some other people, they've started doing a lot more uh, morphometrics and similar things with these. So we can at least decide you know, how, ma you know, how many different tooth types do we really have? Um, and the hope is to start getting um, yeah, you know, and being able to start put, putting these in a position with more complete jaws and things like that. Along those lines, one of my pet peeves is when people describe uh, an archosaur skull in great gory detail and then get to the teeth and say, yeah, there's nine teeth in the maxilla and they're laterally recurved, you know, laterally compressed, recurved and serrated and on to the, you know, onto the next bone. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> um, so, I mean, but there, there are people doing a lot more, you know, measurements and, and there's, you can, you can group these things, but it's, yeah, it's very different than what you're perhaps used to. Um, and we don't get as many just like straight little jaws. Um, I know you guys, you, you get, you, know, you get little herp jaws, amphibian lizards, salamanders, things like that, which um, are obviously um helpful so yeah no it's a it's a um it's a brave new world down here in the in the triassic 
David, do we have any questions out there from the audience or you? We do. So just a reminder to our audience watching, if you have questions for Andy, go ahead and put them in the comments of the Facebook uh, the video, or you can reach out to us on the Gray Fossil site Twitter or Instagram. If you can't put any questions on Facebook for some reason, we do have one question. This is from Kent from Oregon, who asks, what is the one most interesting fossil to you from each of the two locations? Most interesting fossil from each of the two locations. Um, so, uh, yeah, one of the things I'm going back to South Africa to look at, there's some, we have a little bit of some more kind of associated Arcosar bits that look really intriguing. Um, so that might, you know, might be pretty close to the split of, of true Arcosars from sort of the lineages. Um, I actually, though, I, I really kind of like the sharks because to, to Blaine's point, I mean, you can at least identify them <laughs> um, so you can see them and, and you, we kind of know where they are. So they're not maybe as newsworthy, but, um, but they're neat. The, the Polish fossils that um, I really like that Prokolifana jaw, I've used that one, but I mean, just a, a lot of them, they were just, they were so intriguing to get to see this nearly complete preservation the frustrating thing was is that it taught me that because the the way that polish stuff was preserved and the way the drefontaine stuff was preserved i just don't think there's a lot of overlap in the two assemblages but uh, also getting to you know the the frog though getting to really study that early frog and that was not just the hip bone there there were some other bones those those were really neat things to be able to to see and look at Andy, can you tell us a little bit more about that jaw? What what was that animal? What was it like? So yeah, so the Prochlophonid. Um, bear with me. I'll just uh, I'll scroll really zippy. Um, so these were you know that we have complete Prochlophonids in South Africa. Did I overshoot them? There we go. Um, so they're they're known as anapsids. They're one of the one of the tetrapod the amniote groups that didn't have any fenestrae and these things probably occupied a a broadly lizard-like niche um now they have relatively um they have relatively complex dentitions so now i'm trying to find my closest look at um procolina there and um so they were pro but i mean herbivores or maybe insectivorous um so yeah, let's go and look at this guy here. And you know, I'm sorry, I don't have multiple views um, of these guys, but they have actually kind of, of, as far as reptiles go, they have rather molar looking like teeth. A lot of them are a little bit broader, have more than one cusp on them and so on. So what you're, what you're seeing there is the right lower jaw. So front is to the right and the back is to the left. And they they have about you know nine or so teeth. The uh, sixth or seventh one, whoops, sorry, is is the larger one of that. And so they had a bunch of sort of exploded skulls of these in Poland. They had a lot of the maxilla, which has the other thing. So uh, yeah, another thing that mammal people are used to seeing that you don't see a lot of in the Triassic is like tooth wear, a you know, true occlusion. You don't a lot of these animals don't have wear facets and things like that on mm -hmm. their teeth. The teeth uh, here remind me of uh, maybe of a skink or something like that, but are they actually rooted? So, um, yeah, they're, they're sort of acrodont, really. Uh -huh. um, okay. So, I mean, they're pretty firmly uh, affixed, and that's one of the things that lets you know you've got a prochlophonid and not because there are, I mean, I didn't, I didn't show many pictures or I didn't show any pictures of them, but there are some lepidosauromorphs. There's some things that have more pleurodont dentitions mm -hmm. in there too. And a lot, you know, and then just tons of tiny little um, teeth as a result um, in those systems too. So yeah, there's a lot of things that are occupying those sort of small insectivorous to, you know, possibly herbivorous lizard-like niches in that ecosystem. And that does, that is kind of the, the Brits, their younger filler, fissure fills, I think kind of, that's where a lot of the oldest sphenodontians come from are those British or not 
not necessarily the oldest, but a lot of those early sphenodontians, the Triassic sphenodontians are probably best known from the, the British fissure fills. So if you're people not familiar, sphenodontians, the, the Tuatara is the last living um, sphenodontian, but the sister group to modern day lizards. Um, so, and those were actually much more common in the Triassic and somewhere along the line, they lost out. David, any, any others coming in? Yep, we've got one more question from Mason who asks, how continuous are these assemblages with later Triassic assemblages? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, I guess continuous, there's, there's not a lot of, um, there's relatively few taxa that show up in multiple, you know, that cross say early to middle or middle to late Triassic, but there are some. Palacrodon is one of the animals that's known from Driefontein um, that shows up in South Africa. And then we've, we actually have a, you know, it or a similar thing from the late Triassic of, of North America. But by and large, um, very little else is, is continuous. Um, so, but again, I'm thinking in terms of the Arcus, at least in terms of the Arcus Aramorph, so we're challenged by the fact that we're looking at largely isolated teeth. Um, although if you, if you make a series of observations on those things, you can, you can make some, you can see discrete uh, morphotypes. Um, and the Cretaceous theropod workers have actually done a nice job of doing that lately. And we need to better, I need to learn to better emulate their techniques. Um, the sharks, like I say, Lesotus, you know, something Lesotus or Lesotus like is known all the way until the Cretaceous. Um, so, you know, what that means biologically, I don't know, because, you know, there's, I don't know, 30 or so generally recognized species. Um, and, um, and these are like, say, are very, very small body size. We don't see those at larger body size. So, I mean, the idea of behind this project was hoping to even see some continuity between the Polish microvertebrates and these microvertebrates and the, some of the larger animals, Garjania, the big predator, it's known, it was described in Russia, the species in South Africa as a second species. So it, it's behaving more like a typical Pangean animal, but these smaller animals are, appear to be maybe a little more endemic and they definitely don't, as a general rule, have the long stratigraphic ranges. Where will you look next? Where will I look next? Um, so <laughs> I, you know, I, I need to jump back into the late Triassic here a little bit this, um, this spring and summer. Um, but um, I'm looking forward to going back to South Africa and spending more time with this assemblage and being able to show off maybe some, some less preliminary stuff before long. I'd love to go back to, to Argentina or, uh, and or Brazil. I mean, I've, I've had the good fortune to work there in the past and they, they just don't have the faces that are good for this, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't find a site somewhere. As you, I mean, in a very cartoony sense, the kind of famous Triassic uh, late Triassic assemblages of Argentina are sort of in like alluvial fans by and large. And so it's just not good for preserving little animals. Um, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. So. All right. We are just about at the end of time. We've got one more audience question that we can get to. This one is from M. Shafi Bhatt, who asks, Indian late Triassic have similar microvertebrates, is there any relationship with respect to climate or paleobiogeography? So yeah, so um, so Dr. Bat has um, published a lot on the Indian fossils of late. Um, I'm really looking forward uh, to more of those publications. And it is interesting because the microvert, you know, just generally speaking, those Indian assemblages always look much more like Laurasian assemblages than do the Argentine or Brazilian ones. And I don't know why that is. Um, I don't know if that's climate. I don't know if it's facies, if it's a little bit of both or what, but, um, but yeah, no, I've, I've had the good pleasure of reviewing a couple of, of his papers and um, 
yeah, they're, you know, and they're doing a great job, this new generation of Indian workers of publishing those Triassic fossils. They're, they're interesting and exciting. Um, so yeah, do I, I mean, from the description, you know, from sort of preliminary descriptions of unpublished stuff from India too, it really sounds like a Chinle, you know, it sounds like Western North America. And I'm, I'm curious as to why that is myself. All right, I guess we'll wrap it up, David. Yep, it is about that time. Thanks to everybody for submitting questions and for joining us today. Thank you again, Andy, for joining us. We learned a lot. If you could stay on with us for just a minute after we shut her down. Sure thing. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, everybody.